can't really put a price on perfect peace. Luke chapter number 2. Last week we started talking about the wise men who came to see the Lord at least a couple of years after He was born. They didn't come to the manger, the barn. They came instead to the house. They didn't see the baby in the manger. This week I'm going to talk about the baby in the manger. And let me say this to you just for a point of information. It literally makes no sense at all to try to fit the actual birth of Christ into the December time frame. Right. Very much aware of the fact that he was born probably more toward the fall of the year around the Feast of Tabernacles in that particular time, September, October. Very much aware that shepherds wouldn't be out manning, manning their flocks in December, a time of cold and snow and ice and those kinds of things. But I want you to understand that sometimes you take a story in the Bible and instead of worrying so much about either geographically or on a timeline trying to make it fit into something, to get the meat or the context, the heart of the story, it meant enough to the Holy Spirit that He put it in your Bible. Amen. And therefore it should be preached on, but I'm not going to wait until September or October to preach it and then, not, then preach on the Easter Bunny on Christmas time. Christmas time for us is a time of giving of one's self and giving to each other. But it's a time where we commemorate the giving of the greatest gift, and that was Amen. Him Amen. given to us. Yes. So I think we can doctrinally be safe to do it without compromise, that we understand it's not a time for commercialization. But it is a time to remember that if He hadn't have been born, then He never would have died. And of all the ways that He came instead of coming as a full-grown man, which he wrote the script, he could do it if he wanted to, but he chose to come as a baby. Yeah. I, I don't know if, if, if in your mind, maybe I make too much of this, but to imagine the God of the universe, the all-powerful God who has the ability to speak things into existence, confining himself to the body of a baby, it has to be cared for without employing his supernatural power. He didn't come out of the womb walking and talking and doing miracles. He came out into the world and put himself as an innocent, helpless child that had to be taken care of by somebody else. And to me, that the exercise and restraint there is a lesson I wish I could fully grasp. He's all God, manifest in the flesh, confined to the body of a baby. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. So please just indulge me as I tell you a little bit about this story. And just pick it up. I'll give you the first four or five verses here, and then we'll uh, pray and get right into the message. The Bible said, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth in Judah, or Judea, excuse me, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Brother Ernie, you pray, would you please ask the Lord to help us with the message? Heavenly Father, we do thank you. For the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, you gave us the greatest gift that man could ever have. Amen. Your son. Amen. Lord, I ask you, Father, this morning that you open up our hearts and fill our hearts. Lord, we ask you that you be with our preacher this morning. Father, we pray that you use him. Lord, anoint him this morning. Father, may your power be upon him. Be able to preach your word. Lord, we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 As you're being seated, can I maybe capture your mind for just a moment or two to imagine in the modern vernacular, even among Bible believers nowadays, that if Mary and Joseph and that group of individuals had been rebels or sovereign citizens, 
that they wouldn't have been where they needed to be for the Lord to fulfill the prophecies that were in the Old Testament. Doesn't the Bible say there in the passage, Brother Calvin, doesn't it say in the passage that all the world was to be taxed? And it says, and everyone had to go. Isn't it interesting what God uses to get them in the place that they're supposed to be? Suppose they decided to disobey the order. You say, well, it's just a wicked government. Yeah, it's Rome. It is a wicked and unorthodox government. There's no question about that. You ever realize who was in power when Peter said that uh, you're supposed to subject yourself to every ordinance of man and that you're to pay taxes so that the word of God be not blasphemed? Do you realize who was in power when Peter wrote that? Nero was in power. Nero was burning Christians at the stake to light the pathway up there uh, during that time. And Peter said, submit yourself to every ordinance of God. Isn't it interesting that Paul writes in Romans chapter number 13 that the ones that God ordains, God ordains. And he ordains them because God's the one that chooses to put them there. I think it's interesting if they were tax evaders, if they would have not been where God... Isn't, is, does that make any sense to you at all? That God can even use governmental needs to wind up getting accomplished what He needs to get accomplished. They're not aware of that. Think of the timing of this for a minute. She's just at the end of her gestation there, just coming to the end of her nine months. I mean, thinking about her traveling, riding on a donkey in and of itself, she must have been so more woman, even though she was most likely very young. Can I just say this to you? I mean, when you get that close to delivering a child... I mean, I mean, it's more than nowadays they have you bounce on a ball or go for a walk or whatever. Imagine riding a donkey and getting down to the place and you get ready to check into the Holiday Inn or the Marriott or the Ritz-Carlton or whatever it might be. And the Bible says there was no room for him. I mean, imagine that. Imagine that she comes along there and he keeps saying, honey, just over the next rise and just uh, we get out here just a little bit further and imagine the peril that she must have thought and how fearful she must have been to be making that trip, realizing that along the way, because everybody's going, there's certainly going to be thieves and robbers there. I mean, the peril that they would have been into uh, just going there, let alone just from the childbirth, but also the fact that there's going to be robbers and other people along the way. And it's just her and Joseph. He doesn't have something he's got on his side. He doesn't have an AK slung around his uh, shoulder or anything like that. All he's got is a donkey and a woman and some food. And if they're going to be taxed, he probably has some money. They're good, uh, I guess you might say, they'd be good marks for being robbers. i just like to say this, ladies and gentlemen, that sometimes when I hear a lot of this anti-governmental stuff and this uh, resist the powers that be and so on and so forth, I think about it in this context. If they had done that, God would have had to figure out a different way to get them to Bethlehem. Because they had already predicted in the Old Testament that's exactly where he was going to be born. God ordained that to be done. But isn't it interesting that the Lord uses that and uses that particular time to get them in the position they need to get into so that they can be born? Isn't it interesting when you get to read in the Bible that when they get there, the Lord already knew there was not going to be a place for them to, be, to, to have a hotel room? He filled up all the hotels and motels. He filled up all the houses. And she goes to the innkeeper there and she bangs on the door. The innkeeper, he does, and she's over there and he looks out there and he sees the woman looks like she swallowed a watermelon seed and she's sitting there. Maybe she's panting or whatever, leaning up against the donkey. I don't know. Poor donkey. He's carrying the price of two for one there. But that little donkey is out there and they're banging on the innkeeper's door and he says, we don't have any room. I realize when I read Revelation chapter number 3 in the day and time in which we live, the Bible says in Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will come unto me and I come unto me, I'll come in and sup with him. But I'm opening the door. But would you open the door or would there not be any room? I mean, there's room for Santa Claus and there's room for presents and there's room for Christmas parties and there's room for financial, you know, doling out to taking care of everybody who's anybody and that kind of thing. But if the Lord were to knock on your door today, would your saying be the same? I don't have any time. I don't have any room for you right now. My daytimer's full. I, I got too many things to do, too many places to see and too many people to see. I, I, I just don't have time for you right now to make time for him one day. Yes. I mean, even those of you that are saved. I'm talking mostly to saved people this morning. I mean, the Lord chooses an inopportune time, a time of taxes for all things, if you think about that, to decide that's when he's going to have the child born. He uses and moves upon the heart of the Caesar there or the one that's in charge there, Cyrenus, and he comes in and he decides, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have the whole world taxed. He wasn't even in control of it. God was in control of the whole thing just to get two people in the position where his boy could be born. 
Do you ever realize that when you resist the things that God ordains, that even in Jude, he says about that, and I'm going to move on here. Some of you get uncomfortable when I'm on this. But you know what he said? Even the angels durst not bring a railing accusation against the people that you don't have a problem talking about. God put the people in there for a reason. It's not all about you. I don't care if you don't like the guy in the White House. That's, but, but your problem is, is God put the guy in the White House. You say, what? It wasn't about you. Right. I know you find that hard to believe. God's given a nation what they deserve. Right. And you know what you should say? Praise the Lord. That's who God wants in there. Then fine. It doesn't change your bottom line. I realize you think you got the power to do that. But the Bible says God puts them in there. Yeah. Now, you've been made to believe that it's different than that, but I'm, I'm not even talking about whether you want to believe you do or don't, your attitude toward it once they're there. That's it. It's not your family. Right. It's a world that we're talking about. The whole world should be taxed, and each one of them individually has to give an account when they go there. They have to talk about how much money they make, what kind of job they have, how many lands they own, how many stock or animals they have, or what their possessions are, and everywhere from 1% to 3% of their income is automatically taken out, and then the ones that wind up doing the collecting are there, but they have to give it a... I wondered sometimes when I read that, I wonder if they cheat on their income taxes. <laughs> I mean, they're going in there, they're on their own merit. They have to give the, what it is it's doing. And then they have to sign a decree there that promises uh, loyalty to the government that they're in sedition against already. That's a strange thing going on behind the scenes. All that in the meantime, the whole world is now focused in one particular thing. This woman is about to have the water break and the baby's going to come ready or not. Here she comes. And all of a sudden the guy says, uh, well, look, man, I got a place out there in a the barn. And, you know, it isn't much, a bunch of animals out there. They don't realize the Lamb of God. They don't understand the tight pictures and all that. But look at God's attention to details. As a matter of fact, in just a few moments of all the places that he could have the birth announced, and just like when he came up out of the tomb, he appears to that girl that was a prostitute, just like that. He goes out there, and instead of appearing to all the who's who in the, that particular city there in Bethlehem, the city of David, instead of doing that, you know what he does? He goes out into the field out there to talk to some shepherds. Yeah. But of course, it is a lamb that got born. But look at the attention to detail. Look at how he goes out of his way to be able to do something so that all the way up here in 2023, you can see some pictures that are made. You can see some things that God's done because the birth of his son meant something to him. Yeah. That's God manifest in the flesh that's born there. And that's your hope laying there in a manger. Yeah. Amen. You winds up all those babies that are two years of age and hunger, they wind up dying because of that baby. People throughout centuries now have died because of that baby, because of their commitment to that baby. You say, why? That baby came and never one time raised his foot up or raised up a sword to try to come against anybody. He came to die for mankind so that mankind might live eternally. All that wrapped up in swaddling clothes there and laying in a manger. And what happens with the announcement? I'd like to point out a couple of things about the shepherd, if I could please, this morning, or the shepherds there. I'd like to say, first of all, that the shepherds were faithful because they were out tending their flocks. They had a mindset that they had a duty or a responsibility. Uh, they were faithful. I guess you could even say they were diligent to do what they were supposed to do. I wonder if those particular shepherds who came there, and the Bible doesn't say how many was there and how large the flock was, but I wonder if they hadn't have decided on that particular night time, because even in time of darkness, that'd be the easiest time to shirk your responsibility because nobody can see you. But I'd like to say this, I wonder if they decided to take that night off. They didn't know the night was going to happen. They weren't the magi. They weren't the, the magicians. They weren't the wise men. They didn't know anything like that. They must have known one day that it was going to be somebody show up. You find that later on. They have a belief in the Lord. The Lord doesn't appear to unbelievers. He said, we need to go see uh, this thing that the Lord has shown us. That, that's there. I understand that. But I wonder if they just decided to take that night off from church. Just take that night off from uh, tending the sheep. But, you know, because all the nights are the same as they've always been, and, you know, I'm tired of doing the same thing, the, the routine duty speaks a whole lot to me about the character of these guys. They're outside in the darkness tending sheep, and they can't see anything. And all those sheep that are out there before them are counting on the shepherds to take care of them. And of all the places that the Lord could have the birth of His Son announced, He announces it first and foremost to a bunch of shepherds. Now, just so that you understand, shepherds were considered to be kind of low on the totem pole. 
Shepherds was something that a lot of people did. And while it requires a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of insight to know certain things about that, shepherds were not considered to be uh, the upper echelon. And they were always separated from everybody else. Why? They were spending time in the field watching sheep. You don't really have a whole lot of time to fellowship with a whole bunch of people. Your, your congregation is just sheep. And you're out there in the pasture when everybody else is home asleep and warm in the bed. And you're watching for bears and lions and wolves and those kinds of things and taking care of sick sheep and well sheep and moving them from one pasture to the next pasture on a regular basis. Can I just say this? It wasn't a very luxurious, elegant lifestyle. When we were in Romania, we went out one day. It was kind of spitting snow a little bit, just flurries and all that, and in between drizzling rain and all. It was real gray and dark and cold, right around 30, 25, 30 degrees and stuff. And then I looked out there, and this guy looks like this giant, like a straw bale or a hay bale. And I keep looking at it. I said, Jim, come here and look at this. And he looked out there, and you could see the top of his head, and he's got this big thing around him here. He looks like a, a, a moving hay bale. He's just, it, it's kind of rounded out. And he would walk along there and he got the sheep out across the road and he starts them down into this pathway, pretty well beaten pathway there. And he's walking down there and it was a shepherd. And so we asked him through the interpreter, what it, what, what do you, why do you wear that? Is it because you're cold and stuff like that? And he said, no, you can stand out right in the middle of the sheep, he said, because that way when the wolves come or when stray dogs, in that case, when stray dogs come out here, he said, you can get up there. And he said, they don't ever see you coming. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, this is what I do all day. I stand here and watch sheep. Who would have appeared to a shepherd? Why not appear to Herod in the king's palace? Why not appear to the rich people, the tax collectors, the publicans? Why not appear to all the who's who have ever been born in the city of David that's there? Why not appear to all them? You know what he did? He goes out there and appears to a bunch of people that are dressed up like hay bales and they're out there in their coats and they're out there in the weather and they're out there doing what? Just taking care of sheep. Would you appear that way if you knew your announcement came? I mean, can you imagine that on social media? <laughs> That's not who you appear to. Right. You know what he did to those shepherds? He said, I'm going to reward their faithfulness. They're willing to keep doing what's necessary to be done when nobody else wants to do it. Don't think that your service for the Lord doesn't matter. And don't think he's not keeping account. He paid, paid, account of the, or paid attention to those shepherds that were there. You see, what'd they do? They got up and went to work just like they always do. I wonder if the Lord had got out there if he found the field was empty that day. The shepherds decided not to show up and the sheep were scattered all over the creation. But nonetheless, you know what happens. The angel shows up there. And I like to say second of all about these shepherds is, is that the, the Lord gave them a sign. But I want you to notice in verse number 8, they're in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. The angel shows up there and the Bible said they had enough sense to be afraid. Now, I mentioned this in Sunday school, but can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, I think it would be quite an adverse sight to your normal way of doing things. Angels don't appear every day. Angels just showing up out of nowhere. And all of a sudden, the angels appear there. And the angel comes to him and said, Don't be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy. I don't know how long it took him to get over being sore afraid. I don't think it was instantaneous. But I think that all of a sudden, just like this young and just sang up here, I think a peace came over him when that angel spoke and when that angel said this. And some of the commentators will say, and some of the people that are a little deeper into the Bible study, they say that that's the angel of the Lord there announcing the own thing. It's probably Gabriel. And when Gabriel comes up there and when Gabriel speaks, there's a certain tone to his voice and shepherds would recognize this because they would use that to take the sheep and calm the sheep down when they were nervous. You know what the Bible said? Why not be afraid? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. But their first response is, is I'm up the creek with no means of motivation. Yep. Their first response to seeing something holy is it's judgment day yep. and I'm going to have to give an account. I don't know about you, but I think if I saw that, I wouldn't be quick to get on the thing and text everybody or email everybody. I think my response would be very much the same way. I wouldn't say I saw a UFO or, or this and that and the other. I'd think, well, it's judgment day. 
And I'd think just because I'm self-preserving, I'd think, man, I'm going to have a rough road to hoe, man. I'm going to have some things to pay. Well, what would you be your response if an angel showed up and before they said anything to you, they just showed up like that, not even said a word, just showed up, an apparition right there in front of you. What would be your response? Oh, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, about time you showed up over here. You know, I've been talking to you people all the time and just supernatural intervention and that kind of a deal. Doesn't, I think it frightened me. I bet my hair turned white or turned loose. Because naturally speaking, you know what? Somebody that's in fellowship with the Lord, the first, they think it, first thing they think is, is that, have I done my best? Have I done what I should be doing? Am I doing something now I shouldn't be doing? Boy, I'm going to tell you what, at that particular time, everything begins to change. And I think their life flashes before their eyes. I don't think they're looking at each other. I think they're looking inward. Sore afraid, the Bible said. That Bible says at the judgment seat of Christ, he said the terror of the Lord is there. I don't know that it's going to be a rejoicing time until we get through with whatever all that is. And I have my own surmisings about that. But the bottom line is, is I don't have to worry about going to hell. But that doesn't uh, lessen the, tight, the terror of the Lord. What would be your response? But the angel said, you know what? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a baby, not a threat, a Savior. And you're going to go there and you're going to get a sign. What are we going to do? Well, Jews require a sign. This is before the Gospels there. They don't realize that Jesus Christ is going to be born and die. They're thinking this is the Savior that's going to come and get them uh, uh, delivered from the boot heels of Rome. They're thinking this is going to be the military king. That's why Herod wants him killed. Herod wants him killed because he knows good and well that there's going to be an insurrection and he's going to be dethroned. He's not thinking about him dying and being crucified and being the Savior in that sense of the word. Why even Peter toward the end right at the time of the crucifixion believed that it was still going to be a, an insurrection. Judas tried to utilize that because we're going to create a military overthrow. Jesus Christ never one time came for the purpose of overthrowing the existing government. I'm sorry I'm back on that again, but can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? Don't let yourself get caught up in this foolishness that is being preached out of the pulpits in America today that teaches you insurrection against a God-given authority. Amen. It's not biblical. Jesus never one time came against the government. You say, what's going to happen? I'm living for eternity. Well, what happens if they do this and if they do that? You know, it's interesting to me. I wish that some people and some that are under the sound of my voice would get as upset about your relationship with Jesus Christ as you are about whether or not some law passes in Congress or goes before the Senate or who's in the outhouse or whatever else it might be. I wish you'd get that upset about it and go ahead and make the phone calls and send in the letters and say you shouldn't refer to the White House as the outhouse. You don't even know where the word White House came from. I appreciate every one of you that fought, bled, and died to give me the, free, the religious freedoms that I have right now. But I'll not capitulate to take this idea, this thought in your mind that because you're a saved Bible-believing Christian, it's okay for you to go against God's ordained authority. It's the reason he got where he was supposed to be to be born where he was supposed to be born. And it was under a law that was given by a Gentile government. And God used that to get him in the place he was supposed to be. The preacher, the whole sermon about the Christmas story. Yeah, it's about don't be a rebellious brat. I think it's interesting that the Annunciation or the time that they get it is as they go out in those few verses that are there and they begin to talk about the Lord and to announce Him. And you know what they do? They give all of His po positive uh, uh, attributes. I mean, who's afraid of a baby? Now, we can't leave Him as a baby. We understand that. But pause and think for just a minute of all the ways that a king would come. Why a baby? Now, in those days, babies they believed were born and those babies were set aside to be kings and to be rulers and to be Caesars and, and all those other kinds of things like that. But if you were God, is that how you'd choose to come? I mean, if you had any way that you could pick and you could make the, the situation work out, I mean, would you come as a baby? Would you come as a peacemaker? Would you come as a faith healer? Come on, preacher. Would you come as somebody that's here to die for a creation that's done nothing but hurt you? Amen. That's what he did. Right. That's God that did that. Right. 
God was able through the manifestation of Jesus Christ to become everything that He couldn't be as a holy God. In the Old Testament in Deuteronomy there, he, Moses says, Lord, show me thy glory. And God said, I can't show you your glory. If you see my glory, it'll kill you graveyard dead. And he said, I really want to know what makes you, what pleases you, what makes you happy. And he said, come here, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll hide you. And he puts his hand over him until the Lord goes by. That's a pre-incarnate Christ walking by. The hide us from the face of the wrath of the Lamb, he says in Revelation. And when he walks by, he takes his hand off. He lets him see the hinder parts. And you know what he says to him? There he is, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and caring. He said, that man right there, he said, that's what I'm proud of. He's everything I couldn't be and be holy. Amen. If I had to do without him, you know what happened? I'd have to put everybody that broke the law, even in one point of it, I'd have to put every one of them in hell. But because of him, they got a way out. Amen. Is that how you choose to be? I'm saying uh, to you this morning at Christmas time, could you ever take upon the attributes of a baby? You ever see yourself as a Christian, a baby or not, saved or not, long time you've been saved, short time? Do you ever see yourself for the benefit of other people? Do you ever see yourself as helpless or always trying to steer and control everything? You realize that's God and He's literally put Himself in the hands of human beings. That's a big ask. The baby can't even communicate you when the baby's first born. I mean, after you've had some babies, or maybe if you have some kind of experience with babies, you recognize certain cries. They tell me the mama can tell if they're mad or if they're hungry or if they're wet or whatever it might be. But man, you've got to have a book to work all those kind of things out. The baby can't talk. What if the baby's sick? You need to get them to a doctor or to a hospital, and then you find out they're not sick, they just need changing. I mean, I wouldn't blame you for doing that. I, you know, you check their diaper, you think they're fine, and the next thing you know, it's a diaper rash, and, or the next thing you know, they're hungry, or they got colic. Or, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing. Mary knows that's the Son of God. Right. You think about that for a minute now. Mary, you're going to be the one that's going to bear the Son of God. Now, you take care of Him, and we'll let you take care of Him until 12 when you lose Him. But from zero to 12, you got him, including nine months of gestation. You ever pause to think of that? She knows that's God and still goes through pain of childbirth. She knows that's God and realizes Jesus has to have his nose wiped and Jesus has to have uh, clothes changed and Jesus has to be fed and taken care of and Jesus cries when he's hungry and Jesus cries when he can't go to sleep and Jesus cries when he needs to be changed and Jesus falls down and gets bumps and bruises and Jesus has to be told no. And Do you ever think of that? He's a baby. And they have that responsibility. And the shepherds say, you know what? He said, let us now go. And that means as soon as they heard the message, they were quick to respond. I want to say second of all, not only were third of all, not only were they diligent to do what they were supposed to do and duty bound to do what they were supposed to do and that they got over their fear and that kind of thing, listen to what God said to do, but they were willing to go when God said to go. More importantly, they were willing to go where God said to go. Hey, they had a responsibility to take care of sheep, didn't they? But you know what they did? They walked by faith and those shepherds have said, you know what, let us now go see. Now, right now, you live in a day and time where Christians have uh, stopped doing what gives the Lord more worship than anything else. What is that, preacher? It is the fact that when the way, greatest form of worship is, is when you do what God says to do, when God says to do it, the way God says to do it, where God says to do it. Amen. That has not gone away since the days of the shepherds. You know what they were doing what God had told them to do. First order from headquarters, anything beyond that's human reasoning. And they got out there and they were doing that. And unbeknownst to them, the angel appears to them. They're afraid. Then they get the great peace message. And then they say, hey, you need to come see him. You'll be assigned to you, laying in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And they say, come on. And there's a choir of angels that sing and they disappear. And you know what they say? Let's do something with what we just heard. Amen. Let's act on it. I can't tell you how many motivational speakers I've heard, uh, even coaches that have gotten people ready to play hockey or to football or play baseball games or things, and they're trying to charge the guys up. And even people going into battle, and they're trying to charge guys up, or they're trying to get these mentors to get people charged up to work out and to push them in training partners and, and those kind of mentors. And then when it comes to a preacher trying to encourage you to do something with what you've heard, it's like, well, I'll hear it next week. 
I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, he's, he's right. But, I, but, you know, I mean, I'll do it later. You know what that Bible says? If you're lost today, today's the day of salvation. You know what I do know? I do know people are quick to do what they want to do as soon as they hear something about it. I've seen people go to motivational speakers. I told you about the one at a fancy motel we went to eat some dinner at one night. And I'm down there and man, there was such a rabble rousing deal going on up there in the, uh, the, the uh, auditorium. I walked in, stuck my head in there and stood back toward the back of the thing while she was uh, taking care of some stuff. And I just stood there and I watched this guy. And man, before long, he had four or 500 people in there on their feet. And I mean, it, they were going crazy over medical supplies and over sales of those medical supplies and how they were all going to make millions of dollars on medical supplies. And I thought, you do that every week. Man, they went out of there like you had infused them with caffeine and they'd all been drinking espresso. I mean, they were like, man, they're going to all be multimillionaires and they come out of there, they're just electrifying that whole place. When's the last time you left church like that? Amen. When's the last time when God spoke to you in your Bible study and prayer that you got up and did something with it? If you're lost today, the Bible says, the Bible says today's the day of salvation. You better not wait on that. Don't take lessons from us Christians that are lazy. Don't take Christians from us that are hypocrites. Don't take from us that are very slow to respond. It's not real to us. It was real to the shepherds, man. They were like, man, let's go see that. Look at the faith. Man, what if they just thought they had been hallucinating or something? What if they thought, you know, they'd been smoking that rabbit tobacco or whatever it might be and they've just hallucinated? Oh, that wasn't the real thing, man. I mean, that, that, what's the big deal about that stuff? No, man, you know what they said? Man, an angel said, he's here. Let's go see him. The Bible doesn't say they told anybody else until they saw him. I thought about this, fourth or fifth, wherever I'm at on the line right here. I thought about this. I thought after they got down there and they saw him, I wonder if they thought, you know what, it was worth acting on it. Amen. Do you think God would have spoke to them if he didn't care about them? No. Do you think it moved them at all that God would take the time out of everybody in the entire universe that he could speak to? He spoke to those shepherds in that particular field at that particular time and asked them, hey, why don't you come down here and come see where he's at? Not good English, but you understand what I'm saying. And come, come see him laying in that manger. And the shepherds were like, you know what? Maybe we can go by there tomorrow. And I think on the way when we're going over here, we can go there and then we can go there. I mean, if it had been me, I got to be honest with you. I probably would have said, you know, maybe we can get to it tomorrow. Maybe I can work it in with something else. Can you imagine the inconvenience of it? The timing of it in the middle of the cotton picking night with the responsibility of sheep to take care of. And then all of a sudden God says, hey, I need you to come now and see a baby in a manger. Well, Lord, you know what? I'll see the baby when he grows up. Lord, I'll see the baby later. So you take that stuff for granted, ladies and gentlemen. You don't realize had they not acted on what they heard, the Lord would have had to tell somebody else. Why? He uses them later as a messenger. They go out and start telling other people. When it came to pass, after these things, they went out and guess what? He used shepherds to go tell other people about it. Oh man, we saw it. The angel didn't appear to other people. The angel appeared to those shepherds. When was the last time that you got up and moved when God told you to move? It's not always about conviction. Sometimes it's just sheer obedience. Sometimes it's just God saying, this is what I want you to do. This is where I want you to do it. This is how I want you to do it. Now get up and get with it. Lord, I'd like to, but you know, I mean, the Lord's asked you to let that bitter spirit go, hadn't he? Well, go ahead and sit there, shepherd. He's asked you to let the, 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 the attitude go, hadn't he? He's asked you to be forgiving, hadn't he? Do I need to run down a litany of things? Why are you slow to respond? I'm glad the shepherds weren't slow to respond. Amen. You know what they said? Let's go now. I like that. Let's don't wait. I talked to a young man. He's not here anymore. He got shipped out. But I talked to a young man. He called me and he said, uh, Preacher, I understand you're out. It was on a Wednesday night. He said, I understand you're out of town. And I said, yes, sir. And I said, I'll be back on Sunday. He said, okay, I'll talk to you when you get back. I didn't know what he was thinking about. Came Sunday. He comes back into my office. He said, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, yes, sir. What you got? And he said, I'm so glad you're here. I said, okay, well, that's kind of you. I sure do appreciate it. He goes, no, you don't understand. I thought I was going to die before you got back because I want to get saved. 
I said, you didn't have to wait until I got back, man. I mean, what happened if I'd have died before you got what before I got back? I said, man, you can get saved. You say, well, did he wait to the end of the service? No, heavens no. I said, let's get that taken care of now. Well, I mean, I know you got the church service. I said, brother Sam, start the church service, man. Get in here. And you know what he did? He got saved back there. Now he sealed the deal a little bit later on, but he was done back there. Let me ask you a question. How quick are you to obey what the Lord did? That's a big deal for those shepherds. People just take it for granted. But I was wondering when they got to be old men. And you know how old men are? We're like old women. We sit around and tell, you know, war stories and stuff about how it used to be back in the day. Right? I, it's not a slight toward old women. It's just women t generally talk more most times than men do sometimes. And I wonder if these old men aren't sitting around there having them a piece of mutton or something, you know, and saying, hey, uh, Remember that day we were out in the field? Amen. And the other one kind of grinned and said, oh, I remember that day. So you remember, uh, remember that angel? Yeah, scared the tar out of me. Yeah, me too, man. I was scared to death. I mean, I read in the Old Testament where one of them killed 185,000. I figured I was just going to be first, man. I, I, I never seen nothing like that. Maybe I want to clean up my way of living and doing right and all that. He said, yeah, but wasn't that a great message he preached? So, yeah, you know, I was on the way over there and a little bit of a walk and had to trust the Lord to take care of the sheep and stuff while we walked that way. But, boy, when we got there and saw him, Amen. I sure am glad we got up and went. Amen. And other one said, was you thinking about? Said, well, I was just thinking, you know, now's not the best time. And he said, yeah, for just a moment. I thought maybe, but he said, I'm, I'm glad we decided to go. Yes. Man, wasn't that something? Hey, one of them said after 30 years, I hear that baby's grown up now. That little baby we saw wrapped in swaddling clothes laying in that manger. <laughs> Mary and Joseph there, a bunch of sheep and cows and stuff like that back there in the cow sheds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear he's grown up now. As a matter of fact, he's got a cousin that's been heralding his coming. His name's John and he's been doing it. He said, I understood he went out the other day and uh, he got dipped out in the Jordan. And they say they heard some rumbles of thunder or something. And the other one said, I bet it doesn't like we saw the star, man. I bet they didn't see an angel. Well, no, they didn't see an angel, but they heard somebody say something about, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Come on. Yeah. He said, well, that'd be the guy. Yes. Hey, what's he doing now? They say he's going all around the country. Well, what's he doing? Oh, he's healing the sick wherever he finds them. Occasionally raising the dead. Went to Baptist church. There were too many there to raise, so he decided to <laughs> <laughs> keep walking. I hear he's cleansing the leopard and lepers and casting out demons and making the lame to walk and the blind to see and the deaf to hear. That little baby? Yeah, he's grown up now. He's a full-grown man. He's a carpenter. Knows just how to cut a 45 and how to get things laid in there together and knows how to make a biscuit cut and stuff, but he doesn't put his tools down, man, and he's gone to working on people. That little baby? Yeah, he's a full-grown man now. Wreck where we might get to go see him. I don't know. I'm still waiting on the angel to show up. <laughs> yeah, no more angels. They're getting old now. They're all up around my age and pretty well worn. And a couple of years go by and around that time of the year as things will happen, they gather together again and they're in the shepherd's retirement fund and they're sitting around the table talking over, remember the time that bear come and that lion came by and, man, remember that time old Zeke knocked that one out with a rock? And, yeah. But you remember that? Oh, yeah, the baby. That was some baby, wasn't it? Man, that choir of angels was something, but that baby was something else. That was a beautiful baby. Well, I hear that baby's creating some issues now. A lot of people don't like him. The religious people are really mad at him. And I heard they got him in Jerusalem now. What's he doing there? He's on trial. That little baby? Good night alive, you got to be kidding me. That innocent little baby? Yeah, he's on trial. What in the world for? 
Well, he said he's committing blasphemy. He claims to be the Son of God. <laughs> he is the Son of God. We know that. Amen. Should we go and testify on his behalf? I don't think we'll make it in time. No shepherds say, you know what? I think I'm going to go in the city and crippled and broke down, maybe hobbling and leaning on a crutch. They make their way into the city just in time to see that little baby walking up Calvary's hill with a cross on his back. In my mind's eye, I think the Lord pauses and looks at them shepherds. Amen. And He says, I remember you. You came to see me when I was a baby. I may have changed on the outside, but I'm still the same. Amen. Sure, I'm glad you came to visit me. Can you imagine them shepherds watching that little baby get nailed up there across about four or five feet up off the ground right there? Can you imagine the tears that must have flowed down their cheeks? Like water running down a mountainside after a spring rain. Can you imagine when the Lord says to the women that are weeping over him, don't weep for me. Yeah, but Lord, how could they do that to a little baby? Well, we'd be surprised what sin will do. Yeah. Yeah. Shepherds say, but Lord, you're supposed to be the Redeemer. I'm finished, fixing to finish my work. Stay with me, I'm almost done. They watched that little baby who would one time been hoisted up in the arms of the mother. I, I don't know. I, moms are funny about it. I think Mary probably takes that little baby and when they come in there, she's probably holding that little baby. She knows who that baby is. Now, it may not be this way. But you know what I think maybe Mary did? Amen. Would you like to hold him? Yeah. Yep. He don't belong to me. Would you like to hold him? You're good at holding little lambs, aren't you? Don't you know how to take care of them little kids when they get born? Kids? When they get born? I, I trust you. Man, I wouldn't trust a soldier with that. They know how to use a sword, but I'd trust a shepherd. You know how to take care of, of a lamb? I could be wrong. I think that first little shepherd says, Hey... My goodness, what a baby. And what the angel says about you is true. I'm holding God right now. Amen. And them other shepherds, they're poking at him. Give us that baby. Yeah, everybody wants to hold a quiet baby. <laughs> Makes you look good. Baby likes me, they're quiet. As soon as I get a baby, they start crying. It's like, here, they can have them back. And then they quit crying. But can you imagine? Say, oh no, can you imagine? I, I, I think maybe. Something personal happened to those shepherds. Because after they saw a baby who did not speak a word, they went out and told everybody. And it was noised abroad about, cast out. Man, let me tell you about a baby. Little baby Jesus. And now they're looking it up, they're hanging stretched wide and the blood flowing down. And that little baby, now a full-grown man, is fulfilling the purpose for him being born in the first place. And the shepherds at that moment, I think, finally go, that's why he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's why Later, when the wise men came, they broke gold for deity and silver for redemption, but myrrh to anoint him for his death. I, oh, hey man, this is why he came. And at 33 years of age, that baby hollered out three words. Yep. Amen. It is finished. 
And with that, he hung his head. And he finished the job. That's the real Christmas story. That's what he did for me and you. Came as a baby. Lived as a man. Didn't just die as a martyr. He died as the Son of God. Why? That little baby prayed the way for me and you to get into heaven. Amen. You sang, I think this morning, oh come, let us adore him. When I read that story now, I have a great adoration for him because I realize he had the power to be able to annihilate mankind. He had done it before. Caused the flood, wiped out everybody. Wiped out all the animals. Had one angel kill 185,000. I mean, I realize he got, you know what he did? He harnessed all of that. Amen. Why in a baby, preacher, and I'm done? Because a baby's not a threat to anybody. Anybody feels comfortable approaching a baby. Amen. And you know what he'll still do to you today? He says, come Amen. unto me. Yes. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Lord, I don't have anything to give you but anxiety and fear and anguish and uncertainty. The Lord said, good, let me have that. Here's my gift back to you. It's me. I can preach a lot of stuff about the shepherds, but it's hard to get too far away from the manger. Because of the fact he was born and died, we now have a chance to live forever. Look in the last part of the passage here, if you would please. Look in verse number 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which is told them, what? Concerning the child. And then by the time you go a couple more verses, you know what they did? <laughs> They're praising and glorifying God. Well, wouldn't you? I mean, let me ask you a question. When you got saved, wasn't there something inside of you that just, that burden was lifted and you realized in spite of how messed up everything and everybody is in the world, but wasn't there something inside you that just kind of tripped your trigger that you were like, you know what? Thank the Lord I got saved. I finally got one right. You know what those shepherds are doing? Whoo, that's some baby. Man, that's some baby. I think the shepherds may have been there at the cross watching that baby. And I think one day, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord may show us that entire story played out just for our viewing pleasure to watch the life of a Savior. But remember this. He started as a baby. He knows what it's like to struggle against the flesh.